could begin. Um, there's a prayer on your handout. Please pray with me. <clears throat> a ferocious God, we fear your peace. We say we want peace, but we confess that war and violence capture our imagination and our spirits, violate our violence with the transforming power of your love, wrench us from all hatreds and loves that are the breeding ground of our violence. We cannot will that your peace come, but through the Spirit you make it possible for us to live in your peace. So fire us with that Spirit that the world might be flooded with your reconciling kingdom. Amen. I thought that was a good prayer today, both for what's going on in the in the world, and it, we're going to touch on it a good deal when we look at the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to go look at um, one of the that's one of the first major section in the Sermon on the Mount after the Beatitudes. So I'm going to begin by kind of just giving some general comments, which I've um, outlined briefly on the, on the handout, right? So one of the first things that's worth pointing out is that the a Sermon on the Come Out is generally thought to have five parts. So, and, and you don't have all of that on the handout because that would be a lot of t text, but the first part is the introduction, which is the Beatitudes, which we've spent a lot of, a lot of time on the last few weeks, not only in here, but in the Pastor's Bible study and in the sermons. So there's a, be a beginning and introduction of the Beatitudes. There's a conclusion at the end, so the end of chapter 7 has a bunch of warnings, and then it has a parable, the famous parable of building your house on, the, on a rock or on the sand. That's, that comes at the very end of the um, parable, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. That's actually its con conclusion. And then there's three uh, sections in the committal. The one we're going to do to Today I've titled Jesus in the Torah. We could also say Jesus in the Old Testament law. The next section, which we'll do next week, is Jesus in religious obligations. So things like prayer, almsgiving, a fasting. What does Jesus say about the, those things? And the third one is Jesus in a social issues, where he talks about money, serving the poor, not judging others, these sorts of things. So that's what we're going to do the next two weeks. And then we're actually done with the Sermon on the Come Out, because then we get to Palm Sunday and Easter when we get a break, right? Um, so that's what we're going to be, going to be doing. So we're going to look at the, these major sections in this first major section. All three of these sections in the middle are deeply um, concerned with the old Testament. So Jesus is actually giving his in, interpretation of the Old Testament, which is why he spends so much time here saying, I haven't come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. So we're going to spend some time talking about this. If we if you turn the handout over and read it, if you, I mean, you don't have to do it all now, but if you quickly look at it, this portion of the Sermon on the Mountain, in fact, all of these three middle sections look a lot like Old Testament texts where we get a list of laws. I mean, Jesus is just going, saying, this is what I want you to do. Do this, do this, do this, don't do this, right? It's kind of like reading the, reading the, Old, the Old Testament, right? So he's, it's structured that way. We're supposed to think this is in the same category as reading some of those Old Testament books, right? And then, of course, there's some really obvious things that happen in, in the, that are literary things, right? I mean, so, I mean, I was talking with a couple of people about this before we began today. There's all kinds of allusions here, right? So, think of the way that this a Sermon on the Mount is being presented to us. Jesus goes up the highest mountain, right? And what is he doing up there? Well, he seems to be teaching. He's preaching this a sermon, right? But, I mean, he's giving instruction, right? Well, a search in your minds a bit. Is there anybody else who goes up a mountain? Moses, Moses right? We're supposed to think about Moses here. Moses is all over this, right? Um, one of the things I was saying to people, people earlier, that's actually the whole gospel of well, Matthew as a whole has this a structure where it's got five parts. It's got action, like Jesus is born, we get his birth, his story, his 
Good ministry be begins, and he talks for a real long time. The Sermon on the Mount is three chapters. It's action, long, long speech. Action, long, long speech. This is just how people really do things, right? But it's been con constructed in that way. Why? And why a five? Well, what are the books of o Moses? The Pentateuch. It's the first five books. Like, we're supposed to make those connections. So he's drawing our attention to think, put Jesus in the category of a Moses, right? Um, so I think that's just something that we should point out. Like, the, the audience who w was hearing this gospel read, or was hearing, or was reading it in, in the first century, they would have com made all these connections immediately, because the Old Testament was very much in their head, right? That's just the first thing to worth, that's worth pointing out, right? A second, so this first a section here after the Beatitudes is prefaced by two little parables. Parables of salt and light. We've all heard these probably hundreds of times, right? Be a salt in the world, be a light in the world, right? But what's the purpose of these, right? Part of what Jesus is doing with these parables is teaching us that it isn't the temple, it isn't the city of Jerusalem, it isn't the, the nation of Israel that's going to be the salt and light in the world, it's going to be Jesus and his followers, right? Jesus is saying, we're the salt and light. In a certain way, he's saying, I'm the salt and light in the world. If you follow me, you'll be part of this too, right? So I've got a quote on there from a late a second a century Christian text called the Epistle to Diag Diagnetus. We don't know who wrote it, but he's basically commenting on this. So this would be about the year 150 or so, and he's saying, Christians are not distinguished from the rest of the human grace by country, language, or custom to well, sum up what the a soul is in the body. This is Christians in the world. The soul is dispersed through all the, all the members of the body and Christians throughout all the <laughs> cities of the world, right? The idea here is Christians don't have a nation. They're not a race, right? They're um, the people that are going to fill the whole world and be salt and collect, right? So if we think about salt and flight, by the way, well, actually, before we go there, right? It's worth pointing out, this doesn't say, this is at the very bottom of the first page. It doesn't say, become salt and become light. It says you are salt and light. This isn't a command, if you recall your grammar. This isn't an, an, an imperative, it's an indicative. It's telling you that you are this, right? It's a statement of fact, right? Well, think about what salt and light do, right? A salt makes our food taste good. Some, of, some food is really boring, it doesn't have a little bit of salt on it, right? Um, it pre- Reserves things, especially in this day and age, right? Salt is very, very Im 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 important, right? But light is arguably more so. Without it, we can't uh, see anything. We can't do anything, right? Um, so this, these analogies are fairly obvious, and the idea is Israel was supposed to be the salt and light in the world. That's why God chose them. They were given the task of making God known in the world. God speaking to the world through for them, but what do they do in, instead? They turn inward. Right? So the, one of the ways, what things Jesus is doing here is saying, so if you look at those first parables, and he's, and he's going to go in the, the next verses and say, I expect you to be more holy than the scribes and the Pharisees. Right? Well, what is he doing with all of this? What he's saying is they're the re re religious leaders, and the way that they've interpreted the law is we should turn inward. What's the purpose of being salt and collite? It's to take care of us. So they've taken that collite and they've put it a, a, a bushel over it. They've kept it inward. This is for us. It's not for everyone else. Jesus is saying, no, that's not the purpose of this. You're supposed to be a light to the whole world. People should be drawn to you. You don't hide this. It's not for you to keep and pr protect. It's for you to give to, to everyone else. Right? So what has Israel done? They've taken all these commands about holiness and said, if we do all of, all of these things, 
then God will save us. It's for us. We've got to follow these rules. And God say, no, that wasn't the purpose of this. You were supposed to do all those things so that people would want to become part of you. They want to go, why are you guys doing that? So it's about evangelism and not being morally perfect so that God's happy with you, right? So that's what Jesus is going to do. He's saying, no, this, we're not going to turn inward. We're going to turn outward, right? And this is why he turns to the Old Testament, right? What he's doing here, by turning to the Old, the Old Testament in this whole first a framing part, um, chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, we're basically asking this question, did, does Jesus' teaching contradict the Old Testament? Does he, is he trying to free us from the Old Testament law? And the answer given is uh, no. He says, I haven't come to ab ab abolish the law of the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. Right? The, the, the law is going to be accomplished. It's not going to pass away. Right? So we, we're, we tend to think of this in terms of Jesus has freed us from all of this. Jesus tells us that's not what he's doing. So I've got a, this, this quote isn't on the handout, but it's from N.T. Right, he says, Israel was called to be a lighthouse for the world, but they surrounded themselves with mirrors to keep the light in, heightening their own sense of purity and exclusiveness while insisting that the nations must remain in a darkness. But with Jesus' work, the way is open to find out what being the true Israel is all about. Out. So again, it's about going out into the world, not hoarding all of this light and assault, right? Um, so I think it's worth pointing out, we often suffer from the same problem as the scribes and the Pharisees. We're just the other side of the coin. So they're saying, God gave us these rules so we can be holy and be better than everyone else rather than trying to help everybody else. And we say, yeah, that's, that's right, but it's a bad thing. Thank goodness Jesus freed us from all this stuff. Right? But what Jesus is telling us here is, oh, no, I haven't gotten rid of it. Right? I'm actually showing you what keeping these rules is all about. Right? So we're actually supposed to keep the law better. That also means we have to understand it Correctly, So part of what Jesus is doing is saying the scribes and the Pharisees don't understand the purpose of the law. And the purpose of it is to serve others, not to secure our own self salvation. Right? So both of us are wrong. The Pharisees just think we've got to keep this, this law. It's a good thing. And we oftentimes think it's a bad thing. Right? Um, when we go to those parables about being salt and the light, I note that they don't tell us how to be salt and light. They just say, you are salt and, and light. What's going to come afterwards now is going to teach us how to begin being salt and light. So one way to train this is Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of God is going to look like. I want you guys to try to live like that now. So it's, inst it's inst instructions to, here's how to live in anticipation of the kingdom of kingdom of God even though you're still in this broken and sinful world. But we're going to try it. And, th and the point of it is we're basically walking a billboards for the kingdom of God. That's what a Christian is supposed to be doing. Living in a way that other people want to do that too. We don't get this w well very often. Right? Um, but that's what Jesus is teaching us to do. So again, I think the, the point is, it isn't, if you don't do all of these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you're going to go to hell. It's, this is what the kingdom of God is going to look like. Why don't you try to live like that now? We get trapped in this idea of it's a threat of do this or else. Jesus is saying like, do this because I'm coming and everything's going to be great, you might as well start doing it now. Right? Um, so that's, those, that's what he's doing here with these. And then if we get into the fourth and fifth points I have on the first page of my handout, right? Um, again, it's just worth pointing out some of this st structure. So how does, so I'm on, I'm, you can, I think it's probably be helpful to look on the back page just to see the structure. So this is a, a section. There's this 
a preface that says, um, do you think that I came to ab abolish the law? I know I've come to fulfill it, right? And then we get these uh, six parts in which all of them be begin with, you have heard it said, or some variation on this. It's helpful to recall the original text of the Bible, if you actually had a physical text. It doesn't have verses in it doesn't have chapters in it. It doesn't even have spaces between the letters. That's how they, really, they wrote in the ancient world. It's just running text, right? So how do you create things like paragraphs? How do you end a sentence or begin be, be one? They, they, do, they have other ways of doing it. And what they're doing here is we're actually, we get it a six times. There's a six individual paragraphs here, right? And we're told that by the words. You have heard it was said, you have heard it was said, it was also said, again, you have heard it was said. Like, those are actually telling us we're, we're beginning a new a thought. Right, where the topic changes. But we have to be told with words, not headings and paragraphs and periods, right? So we get these six points, right? And it's interesting to point out, what does he do every time you've heard it was said? Well, where have we heard it was said? Every time, right, he's, he's quoting from the Old Testament. So the first two are right out of the Ten Commandments. It's don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, right? But they're all Old Testament quotes, right? And again, why is he doing this? He's clearly being accused of repudiating the Old Testament. So some of this, part of this is a, it's an apology. He's saying, no, I haven't. In fact, I'm doing it better than you are. I'm full filling it. I'm going to tell you what it really means, right? So it, he sets up this thing. I've been accused of re repudiating it. You've heard it was said. It's almost as if, well, yeah, I'm going to re repudiate it, but then he doesn't re repudiate it. He doubles down on it and actually becomes quite a radical. So if anything, what Jesus does is he intensifies and radicalizes the Old, the old Testament. I'll give you an example here in just a minute, but that's what he's doing, right? Um, and and the, I read a commentator who said, what Jesus is doing here is that he's asking for more than the Ten Commandments without setting the Ten Commandments aside, right? He actually expects more of us, right? Um, and I think what will happen on this is it will help if we look at what he says about anger, right? The quick way to get a handle on this is what he, he does a form of this with all of them is the Old Testament gives us a command like don't a murder. So the emphasis is on the actual action of a murder. Right? That's, that's the rule. Don't kill another person. Jesus goes, but, so we, if we look at the text, he says, he says, you have heard it said of the ancient times, do not go murder, and whoever go murder shall be liable to a judgment. But I say to you, he says, if you are anger, angry with your brother or sister, you will be liable to a judgment. And if you insult a brother or a sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you basically insult someone, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So Jesus takes it from the actual act of a murder to our mental state. Yep, Bob. Um. Brings up something that's been stewing in my head. Uh, Ken Bailey's interpretation yep. of meek. Uh, his interpretation of meek is anger under control. And that is not really what Strong's, you know, Concordance says or, or Thayer's or anybody else. Um, you know, their Greek interpretation is strength under control. And so when Bailey says, you know, it's, it's all about knowing when to be angry, you know, we think of Jesus as being meek. And yep. I don't like to think of Jesus as being angry all the time, but keeping it under control. I'd rather think of Jesus as having strength under control, uh, which really is more fitting of the true Greek inter yeah. English interpretation from the Greek. So Two things. The first is we're going to unpack some of that right now. I think it'll make more uh, sense. The a second thing is what, I mean, this is getting technical now, but what like a Strong's or a Thayer's, for one thing, those are pretty old now lexicons. 
I mean, we're looking at 150, 125 years. Um, so like there's been updated sort of definitions of terms, but they're, um, what Bailey and some of these other more con con contemporary scholars are doing is acknowledging the authors of the New Testament, yes, they're writing in Greek, but it's not their first language. Whereas those other, those older lexicons are operating with Greek definitions. Whereas what some of these more contemporary scholars are doing is finding out what Hebrew term does this person have in the mind. But isn't the Hebrew meaning gentle Well, that's, that's actually part of, the, part of the problem is we have to figure out what term is actually lying behind the a Greek word for a meek, right? And this is what the scholars do. They figure out, like, what idea does this person have, right? Um, I mean, think of the different ways we even use the word anger or a self-control. We use it in many different ways. And that gets super complicated when you have a person who's actually thinking in a different language and then writing in one of, there's like a degrees of what ex exactly do they mean? I mean, that's why if you have a good study Bible, you'll find this with the, the Psalms in, in particular because they're in poetry and some of them are really old. If you have a good, good a study Bible, you'll get a note that will basically say, we're not sure what this Hebrew term means. So we went and, went and looked at the Greek trans, translation, and that's what you're reading. And basically what they're saying is, this is the only time this Hebrew word exists anywhere. We don't really know what it means. We're just we're giving you our best guess. Right? Now that's an extreme example. Right? But that's part of what we're doing when the New Testament and the, the sort of current scholarly state is let's stop reading Jesus and the de, de disciples as if they were trained in Plato and Aristotle because they weren't. They were trained in the Old Testament. Um, and there's a, a long history of, I mean, this isn't, this is going back to the third and third and fourth centuries of Christians now who've got a good 200 years um, period of they've been separated from their the Jewish roots, their Greeks and Romans, and they're bringing their own culture into their interpretation of the Old, the Old Testament. And part of what we're trying to say now is they had to do that to a degree, but there's some things we can correct that we've just taken for granted for a very long time. So one of these things is uh, a meekness. Of we're increasingly seeing it as, um, again, it isn't being a wimp and being, easy, being pushed over easily. It's um, not retaliating. It's knowing when to use your strength, when to use your anger, right? Um, and it's in a con controlled way. That's a very long answer, but it's a way of saying we're c correcting actually several uh, centuries of mis misinterpretation, right? I think this will come out clear if we go look at this thing on, on anger here, right? So this first teaching of Jesus is on anger. What does he do? He begins by quoting the Ten Commandments. So, right? Um, it's clearly the topic is anger, but he begins talking about a murder, right? Um, but then he goes on to say, if you're angry with your brother or a sister, you're liable to a judgment, right? So he, he talks about a sibling. If you, we see that, and he goes on in verse 23, when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you re, 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 remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave it there and go and be reconciled, right? So if we were was talking about this with a few of you, so you can't answer, but what Old Testament story is in the background of this? A brother's, a, Cain and Abel. It's clearly Cain and Abel, right? So why does Cain kill Abel? What? Yeah. <laughs> He's angry at him, right? God liked Abel's uh, a sacrifice and cannot Cain's. There's clearly tension between them already, right? He kills him out of anger, whether it's impulsive, or whether it's been building for a very long time doesn't come at her, right? The idea is Cain killed his 
brother because he was angry at him. That's what anger does when, when left on checked, right? So Jesus is saying here, it would be better for you to not do your religious duty, things like a sacrifice. It's more important to deal with this anger. So when, you, when you're angry at a person, or if you think they're angry at you, your goal is to go be reconciled. That's more, more, more important, right? And we're giving some other, some other reasons for it, but ultimately you're supposed to go and be reconciled, right? And again, think about the fact of why do people kill people? Oftentimes it's because they're angry at them. Right? They've taken my stuff, I want what they have, they've hurt me, they've in, in assaulted me. The only what Jesus is doing, he isn't, he's making this actually much more a radical. He's saying it isn't, the murder in God's eyes isn't only actually killing a person, it's wanting to. It's the same. So the problem with you isn't being a murderer, it's being a person who can get that angry. Where, where does the difference between first degree, second degree? Well, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have any of that, right? I mean, that's just... <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I mean, and we, we, we see patterns of this. We see comments like this elsewhere. So this, this isn't, again, on your handout, but if we go to first... John chapter 3, we read, We know that you have passed from death to life because we love the brothers and sisters. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or a sister are murderers, and you can know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our, for our brothers and sisters, right? So this idea is actually all throughout the New Testament of it's the internal state that Jesus wants to heal, not just our external uh, actions, right? Um, so this isn't going on to say that anger is a sin. It's not a saying that. And we actually have other biblical passages that clearly make this, makes this, this the case, right? I mean, if we go to Psalm 4, it says, when you're angry, don't a sin. So it isn't saying that anger is a sin. It's saying when you're angry, don't act in a way that's a sin, right? Again, the problem is your anger leads to uh, sinful uh, actions, right? And of course, anger it's, itself can't be a sin. But Jesus gets angry. I mean, the obvious example is he flips tables over, right? And chases people with a whip. He's pretty angry there, right? God is described as getting ang angry. Often, right? He's angry when we a sin, right? But I think here we can can ask this question: Why is he angry? So that's part. Of, I mean, part of it is he's angry at, at us because we have hearts of. I mean, we're supposed to be, let's say, a merciful, and we aren't. Well, why is God angry at us for not being a merciful? Here's my hint to you. It isn't because God's the, the boss and he gave us a rule and we didn't keep it. If I do, it, if I do anything in the life, it's I want to cure people of that a thought. Right. Go ahead. Uh, possibly because uh, he gave us free choice and we've chosen poorly. Right, so that's part of it. I mean, it's, some of it can be dis disappointment, right? But I mean, the reason why God is angry about a sin is when we a sin, we're always hurting our ourselves, and we're usually hurting other people too, right? And God loves us, and He loves the, the other people too, and He doesn't want any of us to be to be hurt, right? It's like when you're, you know, I mean, it's if your spouse was an al alcoholic, you'd be angry at them, but you'd be angry at them because what they're doing is hurting them themselves. They're voluntarily injuring them themselves, and that's stupid. You care about them, you want them to. A stop. If your kids do a something dangerous, you're going to be angry at them. Why? Because I don't want them. I don't want my kids to 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 die. Right? I want them to be safe. I care about them. I've been invested way too much time and energy in them. Right? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> right, right, probably, that's probably true, right, as well, right? Um, <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> right, 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 exactly, right? But I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the whole point of, right, why is God angry? He isn't angry because he's like, I'm the boss and I told you what to, to do and you somehow offended my honor, right? For one thing, that makes God dependent on us. Somehow he's actually dependent on how we feel about him and, and act, right? And the Bible seems to portray God as constant, that he isn't, he doesn't change based on what we do. That's how we are. We're unstable in that way. God isn't. God is constant, right? He loves us no matter what we do, just like we love our kids, right? Um, so that's why he's angry, right? So what does God do with his, his anger? He seeks ways to reconcile us to, to him. That's what we're supposed to do, because then, I notice here, we're actually given concrete advice on what to do with our anger. It isn't, and I think this, Bob, this will get to your point, it isn't saying, I've got to have a self-control and hold all this in. Nowhere does Jesus tell us to, to, to do this. Just get your emotions under con, 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 control. Right? What does he tell us to uh, do? Love one another. But he gives us right here, he gives us a very concrete example. He says, go to the person and ask for, for, for forgiveness. So his, I mean, I think what's hard here for us is we think as, because we're, little Western people, we're highly individualized of, I'm angry, it's my problem, I gotta handle it. I gotta get myself under, under, under control. I can't yell at this person. I can't, obviously I can't go kill them even if I'm really angry at them. I gotta get it under con control, right? And Jesus says, this isn't gonna go work. He says, you need to go to that person. Right? He, elsewhere he's gonna tell us, if they don't respond, take some friends, with you, right? The goal is the community now has to handle this. We cannot handle it on our on our own. We need to go and be reconciled, or they need to come to come to us. Like, leave your uh, sacrifice on the altar. Go and be reconciled, right? But doesn't that take uh, first recognizing that you are sinful? Yeah, I mean it, it does. I mean it definitely takes that, but then it isn't to sort of hold it in, right? I mean, this is, this is where, um, you know, the, if, you pay, if you go to the first service, we actually have a um, confession of sin. We are publicly, as a community, confessing our sin, and then we get time to privately do it, right? Um, and I don't think we have to go do what the Catholics do, but there's some power in going to confession. You actually have to go to a, another person and speak out aloud what you did. That's why Protestants go to therapy instead of a priest. <laughs> right, that's what we do. Right? <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> right, I mean, and I, and I think that helps too. I think it actually helps to say it out, out, out a lot. But it's also like, there is this practice of just going to another person and saying, even if you didn't do it against them, it's I did this thing and I, I feel embarrassed over it. I'm, I feel a shame and guilt, right? And it gets it off your <laughs> chest, right? If someone has done something to hurt you or if you've done something to hurt someone else, going to them and just saying, hey, what you did hurt me, or I think what I did to you hurt, hurt, hurt you, that has power, right? So the holding it in part is definitely the problem. Jesus isn't telling us, get it under con con control. He's saying, what do you do when you're angry? You go tell the person you're angry at them, rather than hitting them over the head. Right? That's going to be more effective, right? Um, and this is... An example. Yeah. Um, our dear friend Larry Brock yep. um, would call people and say, you know, I did this to you many years ago. You know, yeah. I'm sorry. And people would go, what? Yeah. <laughs> Often, they don't, yeah, they don't remember. And I, and I think that's, that's, I think this is part of the truth of, like, um, it's part of the problem of us being, we're so hyperly turned 
inward and focus on ourselves as individuals, which is what Israel did as a nation. Right? I think that's worth pointing out, right? Um, that we think this terrible thing is going on, that we've got this huge argument with this person and we're not talking to them. And they might not even realize we're angry at them. And all of the sort of mental anguish would be over if we would have just done that 10 years ago. Right? Is that I think that's exactly what this is, right? It's, it's, um, and, it, and I think that's a secondary way of thinking about it for our inter interpersonal lives. But Jesus is saying, if we as a people, that if all Christians did this all the time, everybody would want to be a part of this. It, that's one nice thing about getting older is that uh, uh, you don't have to worry so much about uh, getting forgiveness from somebody because you've forgotten about it. <laughs> that's, that's so true, right? Um, but, but what about if, the, if you go to the person and the person totally ignores it? What, how do you make a connection if it's completely one-sided? Well, and I don't think he's giving us that teaching here, but I mean, elsewhere he does talk about like if somebody, I mean, here it's when there's a conflict in the a church. You, you go to that person. If they go refuse, you're then supposed to take a team of people, right? And someone to help mediate, right? But again, if we're thinking of a, a friend who's angry at us, a child, a spot, I mean, whoever it could possibly be, we're called to do the best that we can. And if they don't want to respond, right, we can't con con control what they do, right? Yep. Yep. Then you can go back. I mean, in a certain sense, you've done your part, right? Um, uh, but I, I think the thing we want to be careful with there is um, it's very easy to deceive ourselves that we've, that we've done enough, yeah. right? We can tell ourselves, I tried. I tried to be reconciled to this person. Then we can say, well, maybe I didn't really try that part, right? Or maybe we should just pretend that person. Right, right, right. Well, take it a step higher. If you... Um, Listen to the testimony this morning of the young lady yep. from Spring Lake. Mm -hmm. She was mad at God. Yeah. Took, she figures God took away her father when she was three yep. years old and, and, you know, carried this for most of her life. And finally she realized that forgiveness was with God yep. rather than, you know, it, it it's... It was very touching for me. Yeah, it was. It was very but, nice. But the idea of, of God uh, forgiving as well. Yep. But you know, it was interesting to me that she lost her father, and we we still think of God as being the yeah. father. And I wish we could get over it. That and use inclusive language. Some of us oh, have. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but. No, I think that's right. I mean, who are right. in heaven or are? Well, I think we. I mean, I think we ought to try to do that more. I mean, I so we could. We by the way, we could spend hours on this. <laughs> it's one, it's one, we can. We can. Um, so, but it, I mean, my sort of quick obs observation with this is, we definitely should use in, in, inclusive language. The Bible gives us a psalm. I mean, it does talk about God as a mother. It gives God Occasion. feminine attributes. It doesn't enough, right? How do we respond to that? And one, it's, it's written by, by men. It's written in a patriarchal culture, right? So we, we can't expect them to sort of overnight change their culture, right? I mean... But uh, we can, but that's a, but, but that's part of what we need to be doing is to say like, what were they doing within their own culture? So, people read the Apostle Paul, for example, and think he's this terrible mis 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 misogynist, right? Yeah. But if you read him within his own culture, he's actually a radical f feminist, right? He just comes off to us that way because he's using language to us that's two thousand years old, right? So we need to. <laughs> I have done it, but I'll do it again. I mean, I That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we can, we can, we can do some of those. Right, right. Um, I mean, and just to understand, but I think this is worth pointing out. The other thing is, like, we also have to think about the culture. So why does the Old Testament in particular use masculine language, right? Because all of their neighbors are, worship, are polytheists who have female and male gods. And, of course, those gods hook up and make more gods, 
right? And they're trying to say, no, no, our way of thinking about God is radically different. There's only Gowan. There's no hanky-panky going on with the gods. Right? So their, the actual language they're using in their time serves that. Right? Now we've got to honor that 2,500 years or so afterwards and do it faithfully. We've got to figure out how, how, to, how to do it. Right? And also address our own very different issues of what happens with this masculine language, that which in its original context is supposed to free us from polytheism, has now trapped us in patriarchy. Right? So it was a positive thing, actually. It's become a, a negative as things have changed. We need to address how do we stay faithful to its original intentions and also address these issues, right? That's hard. Um, but I think it's worth, I mean, it's, yeah, we can definitely talk about that. Um, in the few minutes I have, so I think we've kind of talked about anger in terms of, right? I mean, Jesus isn't saying don't be angry. He's asking us to act well with our anger. And what do we do with when we're really angry? We're supposed to go to the people we're angry with and seek reconciliation, not revenge, right? It's worth pointing out, he's going to talk about a vengeance farther down, right? We can quickly talk about the, the next one, which is adultery. He's going to go on to talk about divorce again. I notice the same pattern. He says, don't commit adultery. So you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Okay? Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So again, he's saying, it's not just the external action. It's the internal attitude. It's your intentions. Right? Um, so he's, he's asking you, don't put yourself in a situation in which this the desire can lead to in, in, in action. And when you have this feeling of lust, what are you supposed to do with it? Right? Um, and he's, he again tells us what to do. He's saying, if your eye causes you to c a sin, tear it out. Now Jesus, is, he, he likes being hyperbolic. I don't think he's really telling us here to pluck out our, our, our eyes, but he's saying, get out of there. Get yourself out of this a situation, right? Don't put yourself in a situation in which these internal thoughts are con continually to be fed, right? Um, so this is what he's telling I mean, and he's giving us this um, exaggerated example to make the point stick of... This is bad. If you need to, you need to get out of this. If you have to, cut off your hands. <laughs> Again, that's extreme, right? Well, but they're doing it to, to, to other people, right? Um, it's probably the, the case here, right? When Jesus is talking about both of these things, right? We go down to the d divorce one too, right? Whoever divorces his wife, let her give her a certificate of divorce, right? What he's saying is, I know you just can't get a divorce whenever you want to. Divorce was actually really common in his, in his culture at the time for men. All they had to do was tell their wife, I want a divorce, and that was, that was it. Women couldn't really get a divorce in a Jewish law. They could in a Roman law. And he's already probably speaking to a mixed audience here, right? Um, it's also the case that if we go back up to the one on Galust, um, when he says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a, a woman with Galust has already committed adultery with, his, with her in his heart, it's probably talking about a spouse. So Greek has no word for husband or wife. You just say my a man or my a woman, right? The idea here is probably actually spouse. So whoever, I mean, what we're, how we're supposed to understand this is, but I say to you that anyone who looks at another person's spouse with Lust, that means you, you want to be with them, right? You've already committed, committed adultery in your heart. So this is going again back to the Ten Commandments of don't covet your neighbor's spouse, right? Um, and again, he's telling us, right, get out of this. Like, get yourself out of these situations. And the, the problem isn't the action. The problem is, is in the intention, right? We've all, I mean, we can, uh, one way I put this before is, I mean, if we talk about Adam and Eve and eating the, eating the apple, when did the fall actually happen? Did it happen when they ate the apple? Or did it happen when they chose to eat, eat the apple? Right? The 
A choice is when it actually happened. That's the point when, when they said, I'm going to serve me, not God. The action is just the consequence. That's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He's saying the action isn't the problem. It's your internal estate that leads you to that. That's what we want to uh, fix. Right? Um, so part of what he's going to get at with, with, with all of these is the actual concrete action is a consequence of the internal estate. That's where the right, but that's and that's where the problem lies, right? And it isn't enough to have rules that say don't do this. We actually want to transform people so that they don't want to do these things, right? Right. And I think that's I mean that's definitely part of this, right? Of, of I mean, what is he telling us here? Of we you know this whole thing on Colossi is saying you're going to feel this way. That's a normal. You are an, at the end of the day, yes, we're human beings, but we're also animals, and we've evolved to reproduce. This is what we do, right? But unlike animals, we're free to not act on those instincts. In a sense, that's what Jesus is saying here, is like, you can choose to do better. You don't have to act on this, the, the, the desire, right? But that means getting yourself out of there. It doesn't mean just put a, pulling up your pants and saying, I, I, can, I can, can do it, because you know what? You can't. We've all experienced it, right? Jesus is saying, get out of there. Like that's, you have to take action to avoid the, the sinful action, right? I think the other thing that this does that I think is powerful that we tend to miss is, I mean, if, if it's about attitudes, if that's what was supposed to be transformed is the, is the internal part, then really the command here is don't look at another person as a, a sexual object. That's not the way you're supposed to think about them. You don't sexually ob objectify another person. You treat them as a person. I mean, it's weird that, like, if you think about those Ten Commandments, it's don't covet your neighbor's a spouse, and then it's don't cover their stuff. Right? But that's actually what coveting a person would be. It's treating them as stuff. That what are, what are they, they good for? They're good for my p p pleasure. Right? And this is saying that's not the attitude we have towards other human beings. We treat them as human beings with their own ends. They're not there for us. They're there for themselves. Right? Or even better, we're all part of a community. Right? <laughs> Um, so again, Jesus, he isn't telling us, don't be angry or don't feel a, a sexual attraction. It's what do you do with these uh, things, right? They're, they're coming from inside you, not out outside of you, right? What action are you going to take with these, right? They're not the ones that are sort of inward. I mean, again, this, I think that this inwardly turned thing is really helpful. A sin is almost always this inward turn. It's, I'm going to do things for me. And we end up treating other people, I mean, why is it wrong to steal? Because you're saying that stuff that belongs to Hal, I want it, and it's, it's more important to me that I take it from him than if he has it. I'm, I'm, I can take his stuff. What's a lust or adultery? This other person is valuable only in, insofar as they serve me. Yep, yep. Um, tra training them as an, an, they're not human or they're not as equal as I am, right? That's, it's, it's, it's an attitude adjustment that's going to change our actions, right? It isn't just don't do, do these things, right? I mean, if we have to have a law that tells us not, not to commit a murder, and the only reason why we don't is because we don't want to go to a jail or be killed our, ourselves, right? It's actually a very poor uh, motivation. It seems like when you sin, you want the power. Well, well that's absolutely, absolutely what it's about, oftentimes about. It's, I want the power, right? Whereas, again, what are we supposed to do? I mean, th again, when Jesus tells us, well, what are the two commandments, or what's the number one commandment? He says, love God and love your neighbor, right? It's, you're going to treat other human beings as equal. What does he tell us? Treat people the way you want to be treated, right? I mean, th 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 this is why everything can be summarized in that way, right? But even that we twist, right? We take it to be, well, I'll treat you okay because I want you to treat me okay. But again, what am I really doing? I'm really doing this for my sake. 
And Jesus wants us to get to this point where um, we're actually doing it because we see the other person as a human being just like us. They're not an object. Right? Um, we could All of these things work this way. So again, what is he doing? He's saying, yes, the Old Testament law is correct, but we need to understand what it's doing properly. We're not keeping these rules in order for God to be happy with us we go to heaven and not hell. It's, this is how you be a good human. Right? You're going to flourish when you do these things. Other people are going to flourish. In the kingdom of God, right, there's no longer co-weeping and these sorts of things, right? Well, how are we going to accomplish that? The life is going to be like this. I have a, well, my mind's trying to get a hold of I'm more equal than you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. that's a, a funny way of saying it. That, yeah. Well, it's using it on itself. You know, but, but I mean, think of like, I mean, we can, I think, I mean, we can go through this list here and look at all the problems in our world, right? Whether it's, you know, wars and all kinds of oppression, the big things, and then also small local things, right? Of almost all of it is, I am going to do what I need to do for me. And that means all the rest of you are less important. Or it can be this tribalism of, I'm going to do what needs to be done for me and my family or my tribe or my country, right? And Jesus' point is, no, everybody's in this. Right? Um, but this is a hard habit for us to get ourselves out of, right? So, you, if you can go work your way through the rest of it and think with these patterns. So, Thanks, so thank you. Yeah.